Welcome back to the Unanimous Decision Podcast. I am your host, D Palm. Follow me on Twitter at D Palm66. Follow the show on Twitter at UD Pod. Follow the entire MTR network at the MTR network. I want to wish everyone out there in podcast land a very happy new year. This podcast is being recorded on the 31st in 2018, but being released on January 1st, 2019. So it's all very exciting. Uh, new year, fresh beginnings. And I'm going to start my new year with telling you all the different ways you can help out the podcast and support the thing that you're listening to. It's really important that you subscribe in the iTunes store, subscribe anywhere you get your podcast for absolutely free, including Spotify. You don't just subscribe to the MTR feed. Maybe you should subscribe, make sure you subscribe to the UD pod feed because as you've known in the past, we'll drop one off episodes that don't necessarily hit the main feed. Um, leaving those reviews is a big deal too. Leave those five star reviews over on iTunes. We'll read them on the air, even when they mocking myself and my teams to which there is a lot to be done. You should, uh, in the last few weeks, um, of any football season, honestly. And uh, I do want to make um, good on my own personal news resolution, and that's to plug more, to talk more about the other things I do, uh, not just here on the network, but elsewhere on the Internet. End of the year, wrapping up the things that I created. Um, make sure you guys check out the Character Corner podcast. If you're an Aquaman fan, we have a two-part Character Corner there. We had our uh, Super Tuesday monthly mailbag to end the year. Uh, if you want to hear me rant and be angry about a myriad of things, including Aquaman and Titans, you should check that out. Um, also hear about our biggest uh, surprises and disappointments from 2018 in the world of comic books. Um also, you may can hear me on the PW Torch's Deep Dive podcast. I was on there with Rich Fan on the 30th of December, or excuse me, the 29th of December, that's that Saturday. And we talked about the year in, in uh, professional wrestling. Cam's there too, see, at Seahawk on Twitter. So if you want to pass, I completely understand. But if you can fight through the camness of it all, it's a pretty good podcast to be found in there. And I guess I announced it on social media, so I should announce it here. I actually announced it also on Deep Dive. Between Two Palms, a podcast miniseries is going to be occurring. You guys have heard my wife on here many times, uh, S. Palm, as she's become known. We'll be record, we're recording and releasing a miniseries of podcasts where she and I are going to watch the entire Marvel um, Cinematic Universe in the lead up to Endgame. We're going to be recording three movies at a time. So the first podcast will be discussing Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor. You get to have uh, my wife who came kind of this Marvel game is kind of a novice. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you guys. And you get to have her interact with me as we kind of revisit these movies through the lens of everything we know now and all the kind of advancements these movies have taken and kind of try to be honest with ourselves and with uh, the audience as to how it's gone. And if you think I'm not going to defend uh, Thor 2, you're wrong. I'm going to find a way. And uh, that's one of my main goals for the podcast. But it should be a lot of fun. I know a lot of different podcasts are doing their own kind of countdowns to Endgame. And I know figured this is the most fun way I could do it for myself. Um, and that is 90% of the brand making myself pop. Let's talk about the brand. The brand is strong, my friends. The brand is strong because college football has decided its final two teams. It's going to be Clemson. It's going to be Alabama facing off what it feels like. The rubber, what is the rubber match, I believe, um, in their troika of ma- of games but I'm not right because of this, because I think a lot of people predicted this would be the final. Let's talk about how we got there, but before we do, I do want to talk about some other things in college football. The coaching carousel. So we're here at the 31st. Teams are losing bowl games. Teams are winning bowl games. Georgia will probably be losing this bowl game by the time you're listening to this podcast. But the coaching carousel is back. The coaching carousel is real, and there's only really two coaching vacancies I wanted to discuss uh, this early date. The first one is at Houston. Major Applewhite's been relieved of his duties as the head coach at Houston. Major Applewhite's been there, I think, a year or two. Tom Herman just left for Texas. So, and I know everyone's pointing to this, but it can't be understated. In the history of kind of recruiting and ranking of, of, of high school athletes, which probably shouldn't be occurring in the first place, there's only been one five-star athlete not attend a Power 5 school. And that athlete was Ed Oliver who went to Houston to play for Tom Herman before he left for Texas. You may remember the season Ed Oliver wearing a coat on the sideline of a game in Houston, notwithstanding it was November in Texas and the coat was probably not necessary. Major Applewhite decided to take large objection to this, demanding that his best player ever in the school history take not only take the jacket off, but be reminded he, he's not allowed to have the jacket on if he's not playing. Ed Oliver didn't come back out for the second half of that game. He never played another snap for Houston. And Major Applewhite will never coach another snap. Now, I know what we're all thinking. Some people are thinking. Maybe not people listening to this podcast. That, 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 that nothing what Major Applewhite was, did was wrong. And 
you couldn't be more mistaken because when you've got a commodity, when you've got a talent like Ed Oliver who can only increase the profile of your school and in his alumni base and in his alumni giving and his reaching out can redefine what Houston football means, that's not how you treat him. And maybe the school's trying to save a little face by getting rid of Major Applewhite. I hope they do. I think that he could be a very powerful alumni recruiter for them. But uh, he may be one of those guys who says, who never looks back at his time. Emmett Smith was to Florida. He doesn't talk about going to Florida because Spurrier wouldn't run him. And he hates, he hates Florida Port. I'd rather have a good relationship with my alumni. Houston's trying their best. Major Applewhite was not going to help. And the other big vacancy that occurred over the weekend, Mark Ricks stepped down as the head coach of Miami. Now, Miami, for those of you who have been following me for longer than, I guess, even this podcast, all the way back in the Doogee podcast days, I'm a huge Mark Ricks fan. Not just as a ball coach. I think he's probably the best quarterback developer in college football today or in, in the last 15 years. I think that he's done more with less at the quarterback position because he knows it so well. Aaron Murray or David Greens, Matt Stafford, obviously being the outlier. But you saw what he, he, saw what he did with Joe Tarasinski the third, And all you Georgia fans are nodding. And all the rest of you are like, who is that? Don't worry about it. It's not important. What is important is that Mark Richt is stepping down as the coach of Miami. I thought that he went to Miami because the lights at Georgia got too bright and because the fan base got too demanding and out of control. He went to a place that he loved, that loved him, his alma mater, where he had played quarterback and said, I'm going to try to rebuild something here. I'm going to try to rebuild the tradition. He did a good job. I believe winning 10 and 9 games his first two seasons this year was a bit of an admitted step back. But what I think we saw was with those flashes of hope that he had helped bring to Miami, a whole lot of the fan base said, we're not going to be okay if you don't fulfill it. And kind of the vitriol out of the fan base this year, which, let's be honest, the years prior to Rick weren't exactly the salad days. It didn't look good in Miami for a long time. Rick was a coup. And in three years, the fans, or whatever, drove him away. I'm sure he'll never say the fans, but I can't help and look at the Miami coverage, particularly with Miami local and Mikey, Miami um, fan sites, and think that it wasn't a contributing factor. And if it was, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing, that's not a character flaw in my opinion. And I want to share something that uh, it's floating around, I guess, Bulldogs, Twitter, or Facebook, or whatever. It's Arthur Lynch. He used to play for Georgia. Um, it's a story about... I'll just read it. Arthur Lynch posted this on Facebook. It was January 2011. We had just finished the season six and seven with a loss to UCF in the Liberty Bowl. Coach Rick called a team meeting, which wasn't abnormal during that time of year, as we usually met as a team during the second semester to go over classes, workouts, goals, etc. However, this meeting was surrounded by rumors that Rick was offered another coaching job for more money at Miami, and we believed he was going to take it. Obviously, we wouldn't have blamed him due to the pressures of coaching in the SEC and the fact that he was now on the hot seat. As we sat down, there was a single chair in front of the team meeting room where we all knew the hot seat usually set up during the preseason. The hot seat, for those who don't know, is an opportunity for any member of the program to get in front of the team and share his own personal story. Normally, it was reserved for seniors. Others have sat there before, and today was Coach Rick's turn to speak his truth. We were expecting a farewell, but what we were given was the most revealing and telling depiction of who Coach Rick truly was as a man. He explained that he wanted nothing more than to win the championship and finish the job here at Georgia, but believed it wasn't his sole purpose. His purpose was to raise each of us as if we were his, or his own and fulfill the promises he made to our parents and loved ones. As he continued, he then asked for those of us who had been raised in broken homes or without a father to raise their hands. Over half the room, including myself, raised their hands. He scanned the room and after a long pause said, see, my job isn't just to win football games, it's to make Make sure that in 20 years, your sons aren't in these seats raising their hands. My job is to mold each one of you into a good husbands, fathers, and men who also happen to be good football players. Um, it goes on from there. And I know I rail against coaches, and I think a lot of coaches are scam artists. And I'm sure some of Coach Rick's benevolence, tell the story of benevolence over the years, is partially part of the brand. But I also have friends who played for him. Um, I also... I've met him a couple of times. I, I mean, whatever introductions or whatever, but he doesn't, he never came across to me in a way that was disingenuous. People would say they wanted to see more fire from the podium. Well, I hear stories of the things that he would tell them in locker rooms. And for me, that was, the, that was always kind of the coach. I appreciated the coaches in my life who meant the most for the ones who publicly, maybe you didn't feel like, Oh, what, maybe they're not holding the kids to task, but internally there was no question you ran the ship. And for all the Coach Rick has lost control over X, Y, and Z, um, jokes that have permeated both the Bulldog and the Hurricane fan base over the years, 
I uh, tip my cap to him to getting out on his terms, to walking away from his dream job coaching at his alma mater and doing a damn good job of setting them up for future uh, success. The college football final was set. We're going to get Bama. We're going to get Clemson. And the way we got them was about the way we all thought it was going to happen. Well, at least in one instance. The Oklahoma-Bama game, Bama did what they do to everyone who's not named Georgia or Clemson, and that was to to punch you in the face early and dare you to get up. Kyler Murray's no slouch, and his vaunted OU offense eventually showed up and tried to step back, but they never really got closer than 11, and the game was never actually as close as the score would suggest. Um, Big 12 football is Big 12 football. They were able to get by without the, the defenses. I think that this was a this is a better Bama team, and I think that I, I kept throwing around the analogy of uh, David Robinson getting abused by Akeem Elijah on the ninety five Western Conference Finals with what Tua was doing to Murray. But I think what we learned during between this game and the Georgia game is that if you hit Tua early, you can make him second guess himself, and you can maybe slow him down some. But if you don't get to him early, you've got no shot. And that's what's going to be interesting in the matchup against Clemson because Clemson has that front forward that's just so dangerous and that goes eight men deep of extremely talented, extremely determined, extremely fast, athletic defensive linemen. Can they get to two early? Can they get past this Alabama offensive line? It's been done before. Can it get done on the biggest stage possible? We're going to have to find out. Clemson, Notre Dame. I'm not going to talk about Notre Dame yet, but I am going to talk about Notre Dame. Clemson and the quarterback, it's good. That was the best game I'd seen the freshman play all year. Um, I know that they benched the upperclassman for the freshman. He transferred out. It was all very dramatic. But I think you look at the upside of this freshman and you say, well, I get it. I understand why you would be, why, why you have to go with him. He's got too much talent not to actively put him in the position to win. That being said, all this year I've been watching the freshmen and watching make system throws and make the right throws and the right throws on time, but do nothing that would require a game breaking ability. And part of that's because he's surrounded by talent on offense and because that defense will devour people alive. So he's allowed to kind of develop. I thought the Notre Dame game, whether it speaks to quality of opponent, we'll get to you in a second, or it speaks to his maturity in the offense. That was the first game I felt like he had dominated and taken over bell to bell. And uh, that was really impressive. I am not excited, if I'm him, to be a freshman and have Nick Saban given six days just to think about you and only you. As a freshman quarterback, you're gonna. He, this is not going to be the game he goes out and wins, but what Clemson's got to hope is it's not the game that he loses. And I think that's going to be the difference because Alabama has a signal caller who, Georgia game aside, wins football games. And he does so in spectacular fashion with a lot of points and with a certain almost air of ease that demoralizes the other team. It's not just that he does it. It's how he does it. And it's how definitively he does it. You look at the margin of victory for this Bama team this year and it's horrifying. And I don't know if they're going to be quote, unquote, the betting line, what the line's going to be. I don't, I haven't looked, actually I haven't looked at it, but the numbers there, not to tell you how good Bama is, the numbers there to entice you to bet. Remember that because when they say Obama's 11 points better than Clemson, they're not saying necessarily that's They're saying that's the number they think can get you to bet at. That being said, Bama might be 11 points better than Clemson, particularly if a freshman goes freshman. And that's a very real possibility. Now, we're at the college football final. I think we all kind of knew we would end up at Bama Clemson. And um, I've noticed that a lot of hot stoves turn cold. Because leading up to the playoff, I was told that Notre Dame was a legitimate playoff team. I was told that Notre Dame had a shot. That Notre Dame had the talent to compete. That it would not be a repeat of the Bama-Notre Dame debacle in the final, in the BCF championship game. I would not see that again. Which is actually true because it was way fucking worse. I'm done. I'm done pretending it's 1980. I'm done pretending that Notre Dame deserves to be talked about in the same air as these other teams. Notre Dame, what they were for a long time, they were singular in that if your son or daughter went to Notre Dame, that was the only school that every week you could see them on television. It's 2018. The kids you're recruiting were born in 2000. Notre Dame has not been relevant for more than a season 
for any of their lives. And for the seasons that they were relevant, they were immediately smacked to irrelevancy once faced with legitimate bowl competition. Now, without the appeal of being the only game in town with a national footprint, without the appeal of the legacy that these kids are largely ignorant of, you say, oh, they shouldn't know. Why should they? The game that was played with Notre Dame was good and no way resembles the game that is played now. Between that and the shellacking of Michigan, I'm forced to reach to my, my oldest axiom, good players don't play in the cold. And, I, and people say, oh, though, you know, oh, it's those, I'm not talking about the snow slowing them down. I'm talking about a quality of life argument. If I am a talented football player and I can play anywhere, and my, my talent showcased across the country, streaming into laptops and cell phones, no matter where I play. I watch Columbia on my cell phone. Columbia football. Ivy League, little, little nerd school in the Northeast. I watch them every Saturday on my cell phone. So there's nowhere that you can't be seen by someone who loves you. There's nowhere you can't be seen by scouts. Why would you go somewhere cold to play football? Ohio State was different. Ohio State, Urban Meyer was able to lean on kind of the influences he already had with Florida football, with kind of the, the, the southern pipeline of speed and talent. He was able to bring that to Ohio. That's not happening with Harbaugh at Michigan. That's not happening with Brian Kelly at Notre Dame. Oh, we've got a couple of Georgia kids. Cool. You got the ones who could not cut it in the schools. Because they could have, if their kids could have gone to Georgia and not Notre Dame, they would have gone to Georgia. And I'm not saying this to be sour grapes to Notre Dame fans. I'm a Georgia fan who knows that our two biggest weaknesses this year were Jim Cheney's play calling. And I'm gonna say Jim Cheney's play calling again. I'm just our inability to produce in large ta- in, in, in large scale um, situations, and I'm, I'm, I'm a Georgia fan who says I was unsure about leaning on Fromm this year because the kid that's transferring out, Justin Fields, is incredible. But Fromm has a connection with this offense, and that this is a new problem that Georgia fans are learning about. That when you want to be elite, you lose elite talent because elite talent is brought in to compete, and if you can't win the competition, no one's going to hand you something because you're the only elite guy on campus. There's, a, there's 40 more of them. And that's a new problem that Georgia fans haven't realized. Justin Fields, tip of the cap, good luck to you. Best wishes and wherever you end up, don't go to Ohio State, trust me. Now, back to Notre Dame and the fraudulence nature of that school and that reputation. I'm done pretending. It's 2018. I had a Twitter user say that Georgia fans can't talk to Notre Dame fans. Well... I said, and I presented my case as to why Georgia could not only talk to Notre Dame fans, but usually talk down to Notre Dame fans. He then came back with, well, you got to admit Notre Dame's just as relevant as Georgia been for the last 15 years. Hold your horses, my friend. If your argument changes that drastically over the course of two interactions, you know your argument's baseless because you know Notre Dame's a fraud. Because every time, yes, you've gathered around the television to say, look at my team. Let's show the nation what Notre Dame's about. They have shit the bet. This is a team that beat Vanderbilt by five this year. Nothing about their season was impressive, except for the fact that they kept figuring out how not to lose to the Bowling Greens of the world. They deserve what they got. The ridicule, Notre Dame fans, I'm sorry if you take it personally. You shouldn't. I know what's wrong with my football team. Figure out what's wrong with yours. Part of it's Brian Kelly. Did you know he killed a kid? No one cares. Anyway, let's move on from college football because I'm just getting upset. Now let's go to what college football could be. Nay, 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 nay. What college football should be. Because every once in a while I like to share a, a piece when I used to write for Juju Crazy called The King is Dead, Long Live the King. I wrote it in 2014. And it was the last year of the BCS. And it takes you through kind of a historical look at the BCS. I'm going I'm to give you guys a little excerpt here. How did we get here? It's a fair question, and one that is easily answered by visiting the BCS's official website and glancing at the history. The Cliff Notes version is that prior to 1992, bowl games and their associated conference tie-ins were the de facto rewards for finishing at the top of your conference, and a, reg- and a regional fan could count on traveling to set destinations every year. In 92, the Bowl Coalition took their stance against the old guard, said that the bowl tie-ins would help work towards the best matchups. 92, first time that's been said. 95, the Bowl Alliance 
further loosening historical tie symbols, adding verbiage for at-large bids to bigger games, and shaking up lower bowl tie-ins with the stated intention of getting the ideal matchup of top teams. Nowhere in this is the goal allegedly fairness or inclusion or equality. That's what they got. Because they didn't have to say things like, oh, best matchups. They just said, true champion. And like idiots, sports, sports fans salivated. Ooh, a true champion. In the 1997 season, the Alliance renegotiated with the Rose Bowl, the then Pac-10 and Big Ten, Pac-10 and Big Ten game to include the, nat- the granddaddy of them all, the National Championship rotation, joining the Fiesta, Orange, and Sugar, creating the BCS. The BCS's statement. Goal was, it's a five-game college showcase designed to ensure that the top two teams in the country meet in the national championship game and to create highly exciting and competitive matchups among eight other highly regarded teams in four of the bowl games. I'm going to link the piece so you can see the games that were played. Most were great games. Some are classics. The greatest football game ever played. Texas uh, USC. BCS. Barring the occasional blowout of a team that didn't belong, Notre Dame's on that list again. These are competitive games and some were classics. Even more importantly, year by year, there wasn't a place where another team had a claim to replace one of the two teams. I say that to reemphasize this. The playoff is perfect in a system where there are four deserving teams or four conversational teams. But every year we don't get four. Last year we didn't get four. This year we didn't get four. And you want to expand to eight. The problem for most people, from what I can tell, is people have been the, the process, not the results. They didn't like how messy it was or how big conference teams seemed to be favored or how it discounted, you know, that college football has always been messy and always favored big conference teams. One of the unexpected side effects of breaking the automatic ties for the Bulls was that in eight years, eight teams from non-AQ conferences played in BCS Bulls. Utah, Boise State, Hawaii, TCU, Northern Illinois, they were all members of either the MAC or Yeah, they're all the Mac or the Whack at the time. Some, of course, have transitioned to bigger conferences. But if you want to say, how does a big school make the jump? TCU was a member of the MWC in 2010 when they played in the Fiesta Bowl. 2011, they played in the Rose. Where are they now? Exactly. That's how this happens. Everyone's telling me how the playoff needs to be expanded. To what and for why? Are the players getting more education out of these more games? Talk to them. There are interviews floating around. They're, they're happen, they will happen again this year. You just got to look for them because they don't promote them. But where they ask the coaches, what is the cumulative effect of players of playing two games of this magnitude? And Saban will tell you, it wrecks the players. It destroys them. Physically, emotionally. Getting up for this kind of game twice? They're children. And if you see them as more than vessels for entertainment... Anyone who tells you about expansion of the playoff has to answer the question, well, how does it benefit the players? If they're honest, their answer will be, I just want my champion. They're trash people, but they're honest trash people. And I think that's where the bar is now. I go now to the squared circle, not the squared circle, but the squared circle of the UFC. The UFC had another event this past Saturday, and once again, John Jones was the, at the center of the story. But not because, well, actually, yes, exactly because. I was going to say not because he failed a drug test, but it's actually exactly because he failed a drug test. Uh, a, a pop that happened in his test in Vegas that they're saying allegedly, perhaps, maybe, is tied to his original positive. It's a residual in his blood from, I don't know, two years ago, allegedly. And they moved the entire fight card to Los Angeles. Now, I talked about this briefly on the deep dive, but I wanted to go into it further here. Chris has been on the show before. We've talked about the transformation of UFC from sports to the realm of sports entertainment and how it's harder when you can't control the athletes. John Jones is, is, is patient zero. He would have been run out of a WWE by now because they can't control him. And him failing a drug test and necessitating an entire card be moved, which means we're talking about hotels, we're talking about sponsorships, we're talking about space, we're talking about flights. International flights. People fly from all over the world for these fights. And they moved it to L.A. because John Jones and people like him are bigger than the arena that they're in. He's bigger. He's bigger than the UFC. How do I know? In the third round, he knocked out uh, Alexander Gustafsson and won the light heavyweight title. Again. 
He may be the greatest case of my era of an athlete who can't get out of his own way. But it's 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 not a good look for the sport if it wants to grow. Because as you look at someone who is his foil in Daniel Cormier, who I think is a great fighter and fun and, and interesting, he's just not better than John Jones. He can't beat him in a fight. Once it's just like it's not good for anyone. It's not good for anyone's brand. It's only good for John Jones who's going to keep making this money and Dana White who's going to keep balancing this entire pyramid on your John Joneses and your Conor McGregors and hope that it doesn't fall over, but we all know it is. Meanwhile, on the same card, we got a very shocking awareness made of who the center of this future of the UFC should be. Her name's Amanda Nunez. She's the only ever UFC two t- co-title holder. She knocked out Chris Cyborg in less than a minute if you haven't seen the fight, it fits in a Twitter video. They're getting pulled down, but please try to find it. Chris Cyborg, for those of you who don't know, was largely regarded as the great white of women's you have, women's MMA. There was rumors. Ronda Rousey was reluctant to fight her. That's a fact, but it was due to size issues and, and claims of training misconduct. But... Amanda Nunes, whose name you know because she knocked out Ronda Rousey the second time, went in there and made the shortest work possible of Chris Cyborg. And this is what the UFC needs to lean into because Amanda Nunes doesn't have a crazy cool nickname. Google tells me it's Lioness. That's kind of cool, actually. Lion King's coming up. Let's do some cross promotion. Think outside the box, Dana. But more importantly, she's quiet. She's not in front of the media. She doesn't give these boisterous interviews. She's not talking WWE. She doesn't call herself Chris Cyborg. She just knocks people out. She just throws an overhand right that literally made my wife wince. Just seeing it on my phone. Let's think about that, Dana. Let's think about going down, doubling down on the thing that you said that could never happen in the UFC. And that's women fighting. Because it's here and... Uh, Amanda Nunez is a star. Does she have the personality that you maybe say you want? Probably not. But she's a fighter and she's a winner. And you can build on that. You can always build on talent. NFL playoffs are set. We're going to talk about those in a second. But I do want to um, remove my cap, tip my head for coaches who were released. The last few days, Black Monday has hit the NFL We'll start first with the New York Jets, Todd Bowles. Um, third consecutive last place finish in the AFC East. Uh, lowest winning percentage of four years of any Jets coach um, from 90, since 95-96. New quarterback. Uh, they're probably going to bring in a new GM. Good luck uh, to the Jets. I don't know if Todd Bowles was the reason that they lost, but it was clear something had to change. They could have something very special on their hands with Sam Darnold. And... Um, I hope Tom Bowles finds his way back to another top job. I don't think this was a failing on his part. This is an institutional thing. Adam Gase has been fired in in Miami after two years. Um, Oh, excuse me, three years. He made the the playoffs his first year in 2016. And last two years went 6-10 and and 7-9. And, And, uh, yeah, they also got rid of – they also promoted GM Chris Greer to VP of Football Operations and uh, reassign Mike Tannenbaum, which means they bring in a GM to go with their new coach, and that Chris Greer is being removed from the football decision-making tree. Uh, Adam Gase, there's a lot of flashes of good, uh, but I think the Dolphins' excursion has hurt his cachet more than helped, particularly with kind of the uh, front office and the player. Just Google Adam Gase, player player defending him, uh, so you can get a kind of feel for that. Vance Joseph. Finished below 500 two years in a row. Um, I guess you're going to fire Vance, but the lack of stability offensively, particularly the quarterback spot, is is that is Elway that made that he can't get fired? Like my favorite story in the world, well, my favorite story, one of the more horrible stories in the world is that at one point in John Elway's career, he was offered ownership stake in the in the uh, Broncos. He was offered a piece of the team. And John said, no, I want to be my own man. He opened a series of car dealerships. And now John Elway is an employee of the team. And I wonder if every week he gets his paycheck, he wonders if it could have been his name signing that check as opposed to it being signed to him. Anyway, uh, Van Joseph's out. We'll see how that goes. 
Dirk Cutter was fired in Tampa Bay. Okay, so just so you don't know Dirk, Dirk Cutter. Dirk Cutter used to be the offensive coordinator in Atlanta. Um, back when Mike Smith was the head coach. And then, so, Lovey Smith drafted Jamarcus, or James Winston, excuse me. God, that's horrible. Drafted James Winston. He improved to James Winston from 6-10 and 10 to, I think it was 9-7 and seven the second year. They then fired Lovey Smith to promote Dirk, Dirk Cutter because they said that the development of James Winston was only because of Dirk Cutter. Dirk Cutter is there for three seasons, 19 and 29 in Tampa. And Dirk Cutter watches James Winston get legitimately pushed by Harvard journeyman Ryan Fitzpatrick and is then fired. But the owner says the new coach has to have James as the quarterback. What is happening here? James Winston, he got Lovey Smith and Dirk Cutter fired. One for being good, two for being bad. Why take that job? I'm skipping over my favorite one until I'm saving that one to the end. Steve Wilkes was fired after one season in Arizona. Tenth coach in 2000 to be fired um, either during or after his first season of the team. That was bullshit. That was, wow, that was really, really ugly. That's, hmm, yeah, that's really ugly. And I hope a lot of bad things for the Cardinals because Sam Rosen, I think, or Josh Rosen, excuse me, I think he's a good little quarterback, but this is a bad look for... The Arizona Cardinals. It's going to be interesting to see what they're able to build there. Um, there's been a massive reshuffling in Atlanta. Sark, Sark's out. Um, a lot of the people I wanted to leave are leaving. The head coach is staying, which I also wanted to happen. So we'll see what happens there. I'm not going to give this team any of my hope or love until the draft, which is the um, number 14 pick. And we'll see how it goes from there. And we all, all of us listening, remove your caps. Because every one of us listening want the American dream. And people say, what's the American dream? Is it a house? Maybe. Is it a car? Is it kids? Come on. What the American dream is to be overpaid for the work we do. And there's no greater man who exemplifies this American dream than Marvin Lewis. Marvin Lewis and the Bengals officially have mutually decided to part ways on Monday after 16 years. The second longest tenured coach of the NFL, Marvin Lewis. Led to the Bengals to the playoffs on seven occasions, but never won a playoff game in 16 years. I, bravo, bravo, Marvin, bravo. I just, I commend you. And it's, again, I say interesting in Arizona. It's going to be super interesting what happens in Cincinnati because one of Marvin Lewis's biggest talents was his ability to get along with that owner. And uh, that's going to be tough now. Because it don't look good. And, uh, yeah, we're going to see. We are going to see. Well, it's important to know that all these things are put in the books. All these new coaches will be hired. But what's more important is that the playoff bracket is out. And we finally know who's going to go where. We finally know how they're going to get there. And we're able to talk about... Just kind of who didn't quite make it because there's a team I want to talk about and maybe a player, a person that coaches on that or used to coach on one of those teams that I want to talk about. Let's talk about um, the wild card round. Wild card round is going to start on Saturday, January 5th. It's going to open with the Colts and the Texans. The Colts resurgent. I I did not think that Andrew Luck had this in him. Still, I was I had a lot of questions about the Colts handled his injury, but man, he's all the way back. This offensive line's been lights out. The defense plays well and. While Houston is the favorite, it looks like, of the opening here, it's not a slam dunk for me. I've seen a lot of questions, particularly with the injuries on the outside for Houston. And uh, if that may be my upset pick. Actually, looking at this, they all might be upsets. Let's go through them. Um, Seahawks, Cowboys, this is all wild card weekend. I like the Seahawks. I like the Seahawks a lot. I saw the number on Tyler Llewellyn uh, today. Apparently, Russell Wilson has a... 158.3 perfect passer rating when throwing to him. He's also the um, highest rated core of receiver in DVOA this year. And the Cowboys, I don't believe in it. I think that the worst thing that happened was them turning on the season and saving that ginger man's job because uh, Cowboys faithful are not going to be happy when he's back next year, but he will be back next year. Uh, Ravens and Chargers, Chargers 12 and four visiting the Ravens because they won their division. And there are a lot of questions are going to be, um, Oh, can the Chargers do it on the road? The question should be, do you want to play Lamar Jackson in the playoffs? The answer is no. This is the best defense in the NFL and the Ravens and a, a commitment to a uh, altered scheme. 
middle of the season. Say what you about the Ravens and about NFL and being static. And they said Lamar needs to run a specialized system. They went 61 doing it and they made the playoffs. On amazing end of the end of the season play when <laughs> the Browns turned into America's team. It was it was really something to see, but I think that um the Browns losing that game and the Ravens getting in was the worst case scenario for the Chargers. The Bears and the Eagles and Nick Foles, we'll talk, I mean, Nick Foles is magic. I don't know exactly what's happening here, but I know Roquan Smith led that Bears defense and tackles this year as a rookie and should probably be the defensive rookie of the year, but uh, we'll see what happens there. What I want to talk about is Minnesota. And what I want to talk about Minnesota is because they, they could have made the playoffs. They'd be, they, if they'd done their job, they'd have made the playoffs. They didn't do their job, they didn't make the playoffs. Kirk Cousins finessed them all for a bunch of money. They fired John Filippo a couple weeks ago. And I've had listener, and I for those who don't know, I played for Flip in college. I don't enjoy him as a man. But I've been told that, oh, you know, maybe you're wrong. Maybe he's changed. Maybe he's grown as a man since then. That's possible. I was 18 through 20. Like, I'm, I've changed since then. I'm sure he's grown and changed as a man. But what's interesting is that when certain people get fired, you see the talking heads who are either friends or friendly with them all defend him. I want any listener to find me a clip of someone on television defending John Filippo. He was fired because he wanted to pass too much and ignore the running game. They almost make the playoffs in the strength of the running game. And for all Columbia football players who played for Flip and remember his play calling, I assume a lot of noddings occurring. Um, yeah, I could tell you that was going to happen as far as him being in love with the passing attack. Guy's a quarterback's coach. I think he's a good quarterback coach. I think that his success in Philadelphia last year and getting into the Super Bowl and winning one kind of got him the OC job. But there's some people who they have specialties where they're best at. And I think Flip's best as a quarterback coach. And that's the nicest thing I'm going to say about Flip on this or any other airways. Um, let's go to the division round, the teams that would end and got them buys. The Chiefs, the Rams, the Pats, and the Saints. I actively hate the Patriots and the Saints. Like I am, I I cannot be held to rationality with those two teams. But damn it, if I'm not, those are the teams that I feel best and worst about for the playoffs. I think that the Patriots are the one are the buy team that kind of deflates and kind of underwhelms. And I think the Saints are going to walk through the playoffs. I'm terrified of what the Saints are going to. I'm not terrified because the Falcons aren't involved. I'm perturbed. That's the best word for. It. I'm perturbed. By the fact that the Saints are going to be good next year or this year, and um, there's nothing I can do about it. Fantasy Pick'em or Fantasy Sports and Pick'em, we have those are all in the books now. I'm you will hear from me this week if you want. Um, if you won money, obviously, obviously the fantasy uh, football, you'll be getting your money this week. If you won the fantasy the the Pick'em contest, I'll be reaching out to you. I haven't even checked it this week, but I'll be reaching out to let you know. Um, just how we're going to do your guest spot and your uh, swag that I get you for free. But thanks, you guys, for doing it. Uh, I think uh, we had a lot of fun doing it. And I want to say thank you for listening in 2018. Um, 2018, for me personally, was a kind of insane year. I kind of said I was going to take a quiet year, but away from the microphone, I bought a house, I bought a new dog, bought a new car, and started a new career. So uh, doing this every week and trying to get hosts, guests, and doing all the different shows... It is an extra job. It is an extra level of stress, but it's so much fun. And if it's just Susan who listens to this thing and you guys are all like dummy Susan accounts, God bless you. Thank you for think, making me think someone listens. But in case you're not, uh, thank you for letting me be a part of your commute, your day, your afternoon, your evening, whatever, um, for some part of your year. I hope that uh, we had fun, enough that we talked about sports in a way that wasn't the way you hear it everywhere else. Um we sometimes do do that, but I think that more often than not, we try to look at sports the way they're supposed to be looked at, fun, and also kind of with the eye that's saying it's not just sports, but it's kind of just sports. Um, but I've had a lot of fun doing this. I don't actually know top of my head what episode this is, but here's two, however many more. And um, we're going to have a great 2019. Like I said, there's a lot of things coming down in the pod pipeline that I'm excited about. Uh, Character Corners, we started plotting those out. Super Tuesday is always going to be here. UD Pod's always going to be here. I'm very excited for Between Two Palms. And there's going to be a, another new podcast once a month coming out. First guest is going to be Chris. And it's about something that I care about a lot about and don't talk about on the internet very often. So we're going to have a lot of fun with it. Um, 
But again, thank you for rocking with me. Thank you for anyone who's told someone that they know or someone that likes sports says, hey, check out this podcast. I'm at tpalm66 on all the social, Twitter, Instagram. I think that's my Facebook one too. Um, email me, udpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, follow, uh, I guess, subscribe, iTunes or subscribe on Spreak on Spotify, everywhere you can do those things. Um, and just, again, thank you very much. And we will keep going on in 2019. That was your show. This is your outro. Onward, upward, excelsior.